Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. We will defend ourselves, however, in comments. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition, Mark 7, 9. Today we are back with part 12C of Solomon's Gold series. After we're done with this video, there will be one more on the Garden of Eden. Where is the Garden of Eden? Well, in the last video, we showed you the region. And in the next video, we're going to nail it down to a specific place. It will be our theory, but nevertheless, we're going to narrow it down. In this video, we are going to clear up a bit regarding the resources used in these narratives. There are several, and we will show you they have mostly existed since ancient times in Havila. Ophir, Philippines. Not necessarily the narrative that we're hearing from scholars, and we'll show you. Everything in the Bible originates with the Garden of Eden. So once we have identified the area of the Garden as Havila Ophir, modern-day Philippines, that changes everything when it comes to these types of resources. If this is true, and we dare anyone to prove otherwise, then this in fact means that the spices that are mentioned in use in sacrificing by Adam, by Enoch, especially by Noah, came from not Ethiopia, not Yemen, not Babylon, which are the same three places that we heard with the whole Ophir narrative. They're always in the way. They're always trying to take credit for something that's actually due the Philippines. First, remember, the Bible describes a physical garden of Eden in which Yahuwah God planted, not a spiritual metaphor. That case cannot really accurately be made. There is no way to view what is written as an entire metaphor unless one is attempting to change the Bible, perhaps. Not that scholars are necessarily doing that, but those who train the scholars, we absolutely believe are. It is the location of the Holy of Holies and the place of the very presence of Yahuwah God. It was the tabernacle or temple before those places were ever built, and they are fashioned after the Garden of Eden. The, they, the ones built in Israel were also obviously temporary because neither is still in Israel, but the Garden of Eden tabernacle is not temporary. It has been since the beginning and it's still there. Was Adam in a different plane of existence when he was placed in the garden? No. He was perfect, having not sinned. And read the passage. He was eating of every tree in the garden, other than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which he was warned not to eat. That includes the tree of life which was in the midst of the Garden of Eden. You'll see that in Scripture if you haven't. He was eating from the tree of life, and once he sinned, he had to be removed from the garden because if he ate from the tree of life in that state of sin, knowing good and evil, Adam would remain like that, similar to Satan. And that's what Scripture says. We're not gonna, we can only deal with so many things in this video, but feel free to go back and look at that. In another video, we're going to break that story down even better. However, because Yahuwah God removed Adam from the garden, he was able to teach him a way to atone for his sin. And this is the reason for the animal sacrifices, which Yahuwah God taught Adam, and Adam taught his generations. 
much of what was delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai was not new. Did you know that? As Adam, Enoch, Noah, even Abraham already knew many of these things, if not all. In fact, what is the first thing Adam did as soon as he left the Garden of Eden? We will show you in Scripture. Did he whine and complain and feel sorry for himself and begin a rebellious streak for a while? No. He knew he was wrong, and so did Eve. They weren't blaming each other in the garden, which is the narrative we've heard repeated in churches, and then they blame the snake. Oh, they just blame everybody else and don't accept responsibility. Wrong. They accepted responsibility because they atoned for their sins. How dare anybody say otherwise? To say such is to not know who Adam was. They knew they were deceived, and they knew exactly what had happened, that they were bare in their sin and needed atonement. Why? Because they were in a relationship with Yahuwah God. Yes, they screwed up, and so do we far more, I might add. But they atoned for their sins. They paid the penalty for their sins, but nevertheless, they atoned. What did Eve do when she was pregnant with Cain? She worshipped Yahuwah God. By the way, we will get to the serpent seed doctrine that is traveling around the church right now in another video. But as with all things, we all must prove it out for ourselves. That doctrine claims Satan actually had intercourse with Eve, but it ignores the fact that that would have had to have happened in Adam's presence because the Bible says he was there with her. Then somehow Eve shared that intercourse with Adam in the midst of the presence of the serpent. After she did it with the servant. Are you kidding me? This is a doctrine? Oh yes, this is a doctrine. And we will rip that one to shreds because it is not biblical whatsoever. And this is what we do when there's gray areas. This is where Satan can sneak in. Not that anyone propagating that theory is necessarily trying to play the role of Satan. But my point is, because there's a lot of well-meaning people that are just deceived. The point is, is these gaps actually don't exist if you read Jubilees and Enoch. The two books that we've taken a little beating over, more so that people don't understand, and look, that's okay. You don't have to understand Jubilees and Enoch, and you don't have to understand and make a case for whether they should or shouldn't be in the canon. We don't care. It, it doesn't matter whether it's in the canon of Scripture chosen by the Catholic Church. Uh, not really important. There's even a book like the Book of Esther that's in there that we would strongly question has any biblical value whatsoever because it doesn't even name Yahuwah God one time. She doesn't pray to Yahuwah God one time. <laughs> she fasts, but that's actually a pagan practice as well. There is nothing biblical about the Book of Esther. So we'll go into that in an entire video and we'll break that down for you. But back to the doctrine of the, the serpent seed. Basically, Cain then would have been a product of Eve and Satan. But see, the problem is, is the Bible's clear. And it actually tells us that Adam knew his wife and then she conceived a child. Well, um, that doesn't leave room for Satan in the middle of all that. So... There's so much wrong with that theory, and we'll get to it, but we just wanted to say that for now. And then, after, after Adam and Eve had intercourse in the garden, then supposedly, according to the serpent seed doctrine, this would have to be true if the interpretation of that word is accurate, then supposedly Adam then shared the same intercourse with the, serp with, with the serpent. Are you kidding me? 
So, no, no. You, you need to look into that doctrine. If you've been propagating it, you really need to look into that doctrine. This is one of those deceptive doctrines which have made their way into the church because we don't know the Bible. Leaving us pray for deception. And that is what we are doing here. We do not want you to be deceived. And we're going to continue to, to give you the truth as we find it, not with perfection. It doesn't mean we won't mess up a reference every now and then or a little something here or there, have a typo on the screen, blah, 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 blah. Hey, but we are going to do it with excellence, and we're going to do our best to make sure that everything that we say to you, we've checked out, and we firmly believe 100% that this is absolutely true. And we do. We feel very good about the God culture uh, content. And hopefully you do too. Of course, some may try to say such about the God culture that we are trying to deceive people. And some have tried. However, we don't stray from the biblical foundation. Even when using historical sources, we then reference back to the Bible. So if we're continuing to return to the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, of the cornerstone of what we teach, I'm going to have a tough time with that one. Um, and it's fine. Uh, everybody can speak their mind. We have no problem with anybody speaking their mind in comments. Uh, however, if you're going to come and play Jesuit games, we had another one just the other day who um, basically came at us uh, subtly. And um, sometimes that's the worst kind. And, you know, it's just a little subtle seed planted that maybe this is deception. Maybe, just, I don't know, but maybe. Well, is it or isn't it? You know, well, I think, I was thinking maybe, well, you know what, when you're, when you know definitely, then speak up. How about that? (laughs) So we definitely answer those kinds of of comments. And no, we're not necessarily nice. We, we um, will come back the same way Yahusha Jesus did with the Pharisees. And so know what you're talking about. If you want to come at us with uh, even debate, okay. That's fine. We can handle that. We're, we're grown-ups, and we welcome that. We welcome good conversation. Bring it on. But planting seeds of doubt and not supporting it, yeah, yeah, you're not going to do that here and get away with it. However, there are other theories out there as well that have crept in unawares, as Jude said. And we will deal with several of those in the Flood series. To give you an example, we're going to talk about the gap theory. You may be using the gap theory. It may answer some questions for you. It did for us for many years. Uh, Being a a bit scientific-minded, some of us at the God Culture absolutely fell for that. And once we really looked into it, wow. Wow. Wow, we will expose it as a Jesuit theory, which is what exactly it is coming from a Jesuit who went to school with Charles Darwin. Oh, nice. Same college, (laughs) and we'll break all that down. In this portion, proving out the elements listed in passages regarding the Garden of Eden, the tabernacle, and the temple, Yahushua's birth. What do all these things have in common, by the way? We are seeing the same narrative repeat in valued elements. And we'll explain this some. This will further tie the land of Havilah and Ophir, the Philippines, to the Garden of Eden. And you'll see what we mean. So back to just a brief review and we'll jump in. For perspective, here again is Noah's mapping of the entire earth. Notice the three territories of Shem, Ham, Japheth, according to the Book of Jubilees. Again, if you haven't seen parts three and four of the Flood series, you are really missing out because we follow Noah's directions, mapping them out turn for turn, and this is what it ends up looking like. It's amazing. Don't ask us to explain in comments if you have not watched those videos because we have maps and charts and we really uh, take you through all of the detail. 
And remember, we found the three holy places of Yahuwah God on earth. Mount Zion in the naval center middle of the earth. Mount Sinai in the center of the Saudi Arabian desert in Midian. And the Garden of Eden in the Philippines. But we aren't done. So let's begin. Here is the map of the ancient river system according to Genesis 2. All the clues have been there all along, and they have been on the bottom of the ocean floor exactly where they should be all along, having been covered over by the flood which formed the world ocean, which is not referenced prior to the flood, even in the Bible. Let's focus in on Havilah and the Pisan River, though. In Genesis 2, it says, The name of the first is Pisan, that is it which compasseth, surrounds the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and there is delium, pearl, and the onyx stone. We'll prove that out a little further. We see the mid-ocean ridge forms the 40,000-mile-long river from Eden, and the oceanic trench system forms the tributaries that run from its four heads. According to the map of the ocean floor, the Pisan River surrounds the whole land of the Philippines, which is ancient Havila, Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish, as well as Elda, land of creation, which we will actually explore a little further in this segment. But let's look into these resources even further. We took a brief look in part 10, but let's go deeper. Starting with the gold, we have already overwhelmingly proven the Philippines has had the largest supply of gold on earth by far in all of history. We are not going to reprove that completely out in this video, but let's look at the gold issue in a little more detail, and the two other resources from the Bible. The word used for gold in this passage, referring to the gold of that land is good, I'm sorry, the word used for good is tov. It means good, better, best, rich, prosperity, precious, fine, pure, wealth, beautiful, rich, prosperous, bountiful, abundant, a wealth of gold. These are all referencing the land most abundant in gold, in our opinion. Where is that on earth? The Philippines. You could use any of these words to refer to any gold. But the gold of Ophir was referred to with all of these adjectives. We have already proven in this series that the gold of Ophir and Sheba and Tarshish is the gold of Havilah, the gold of the Pisan River, Upaz. We also saw earlier on that that the gold of Ophir is described as the gold of Upaz, meaning the gold of the Pisan River, making a direct connection between Havila and Ophir. We reiterate from part 10, the only other place the word delium is used in the entire Bible is Numbers 11, and it refers to the color of the manna, the food which Yahuwah God rained from heaven to feed the Israelites. If it was a more brownish color, like the photo we're about to show you, the author would not probably have used delium as the uh, adjective, especially not when uh, that particular African resin, if that's what it is, and it's not, uh, is not very pretty because coriander is already brown. But no, he's referring to the pearl white color, because it only refers to the color. And again, this is the only other place the word delium is used in the entire Bible. See what we mean? And here's the alternative. 
scholarly theory that the Israelites ate something that looked like this African resin? Yummy. No way. And again, it is brownish like coriander already, only much nastier looking. So why even mention it? Why use it as an adjective of the food that Yahuwah God rained down from heaven? Are you kidding? It looks disgusting. Because this delium was white like pearl. The accurate definition and that manna would have been beautiful. What is the oldest clam, however, where pearl comes from, ever found? Surprise, surprise! It's not the Philippines. Well, actually, it is. But, but, not according to Google. The entire first page only mentions this one clam. Ming. One clam and only one clam. It's the only one that could be that old. Only, well, no, there's evidence of clams that are older. But according to CBS News, National Geographic, the London Telegraph, the Guardian newspaper, the Review Journal, Christian Science Monitor, by the way, Christian Science is Satanism, as the founder L. Ron Hubbard was a Satanist who followed after Aleister Crowley performing sex magic, so don't be fooled by that name. That is not Christianity. Uh, also, the Independent newspaper and even Wikipedia all claim this. Ming was a nickname given to a specimen of the ocean clam, whatever that word is, <laughs> that was dredged off the coast of Iceland in 2006. Bear in mind, still the ocean, right by where the river from Eden flowed, because it flows right through Iceland. Anyway, here we go again. Obviously, these guys, including the Guinness Book of World Records, who also mentions Ming, don't realize that the largest pearl which comes from a clam, meaning the oldest clam, was found in the Philippines. Perhaps it's a technicality because the Philippines found the pearl and maybe not the clam, although they probably got the, the pearl from inside of the clam because the clam doesn't normally spit it out. In fact, it can't spit it out. So, uh, who knows? But we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They did not bring the clam to the surface to be examined. So, okay, fair. But the Guinness Book of World Records can't do a Google search? Well, guess not. Can we note, though, that the river from Eden, also known as the Mid-Ocean or Mid-Atlantic Ridge, goes right through, and we showed this in part 10, with maps and even photos and everything, goes right through the middle of Iceland without breaking. So, no surprise, there may be old clams there as well. Not a surprise at all. But this clam is supposedly the oldest creature on Earth, according to these articles. They, they all seem to allude to this being the oldest creature ever found. And that is just ignorance. That's not science. See, the clam tells the story further, as the Bible is highlighting not just a place where pearls are found, but a very significant pearl. It stands out in comparison with the rest of the earth. We believe that refers to size. In 1934, the largest pearl ever found was found in the Palawan Sea, and the clam pearl are estimated to be 600 years old. Now, we are not mathematicians, but 600 is older than 507. We're pretty sure. No, we know. Understandable, though, that the pearl, not the clam, but it tells us the age still, and this is older than the one in Iceland. But that's nothing. Look at the 2006 largest pearl ever found, also in the Palawan Sea, 75 pounds. 
Now, this part's funny. There were several articles, and we didn't point this out in part 10. There were several articles on the 1934 Pearl, which even included the age estimate of 600 years. Okay, great. But why is that never mentioned in the latest find in 2006? Let's see. If it takes 600 years for a clam to produce a 15-pound pearl, how long does it take to produce a 75-pound pearl? Simple math. Five times as long, right? That would be 3,000 years old, which places that pearl at about the time of King Solomon. If only that clam could talk, he would tell you the story of Ophir and Sheba and Tarshish, where he is from. Let's narrow this down some. Again, the most significant pearls, even in value, come from the giant clam, the most significant clam by far. According to Encyclopedia.com, giant clams are found in the Pacific Ocean, in the South Pacific specifically, as well as the Indian Ocean, especially in the Great Barrier Reef. These are the most ancient of clams found around the most ancient of rivers, the river from Eden and the Pisan River. And this is the delium of Genesis 2, not resin, from a tree that could only come from Africa, of course. Oh, we are going to explore that whole facade further because we keep running into it as if someone has really rigged this whole narrative to confuse us. Not going to work, though. So, most significant gold in the world, Philippines. Check. Most significant pearl in the world, Philippines. Check. Both go to the Philippines, but there's no onyx in the Philippines, is there? Remember, the description in Genesis 2 isn't just onyx, it is the onyx stone. Many are thinking jewelry, of course, but let's check out this clip from a show called Becoming Filipino. Uh, this is a video blogger who actually ended up landing a show on ANC. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but my wife and I love these guys. So we wanted to just show this quick clip to give you an idea of whether or not there's onyx stone in the Philippines. Here it goes. <laughs> Rombon is the only place in the entire world you can have a weigh-in with Manny Pacquiao and you don't even have to be good at boxing. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on. I've never seen so much marble in my life. It's so cool actually because everywhere you go on the island, next to the road there's these massive piles of marble. And some of them are different. Like here, these are the bottoms for tables. And look, nobody's gonna steal them, because check this out. Like <laughs> way too heavy. Like look at <laughs> Malakas, Hindi Malakas. <laughs> I am the king of Romblon. <laughs> it's amazing what they can make here. It's just fun wandering around and looking at everything. I am the king. Sit on my throne. Filipino. Filipino yes, king. Canadian. When you sit on the throne and just wave at the locals, it's so fun. Their facial expressions are loving it. <laughs> the king of Romlon. That is so loud! That is the 
biggest barbell cutting machine I've ever seen. It's just so interesting to roam around here and look at the way they do this. And everyone's so open and friendly about it. Like, barbell. It's Rome Blonde, not Rob Blonde, Rome Blonde. It's big everything on the barbell. Why do you have to come to Romblon? This is the only place in the Philippines you can find a snow making factory. Yes, a snow making factory. Pick it up. This really is the kingdom of marble. Like they even use marble as the base for their barriers and the sides of the roads. Take a look at this, look behind. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing what they can make here with marble. Over here, this is Sir Laloya. I just asked him, he's been doing this for 12 years and it's gonna take him four days of polishing and carving just to make this one baka, this one tower to marble. Check him out, the master, Sir Laloya. Talent. These locals here, they're like artists. Amazing. <laughs> Everywhere you go here along the road, you see people cutting marble, you see people grinding marble. In this case, I'm helping Mom Gelma do some polishing. Up here, Mom. Up here. Up here. Oh, up here! Mom, up here! <laughs> it's okay now. Marble, marble, marble up here. One more time. Marble up here. <laughs> Alright, polish. Woo! <laughs> There's so much marble stuff here, it's amazing, they design everything out of marble. The heaviest pasalubongs in the Philippines. Mapuso, puso sa marble. <laughs> For those not familiar with Becoming Filipino, it's a show on ANC, and then also he has a video blog. I believe this clip is from his video blog, not necessarily the, the program on television. Um, but we added all the plugs here uh, for uh, editorially using this clip. Um, we enjoy the journeys of Kyle, known as Kulash Jenneman, uh, immensely. He's a lot of fun. Join him on his Twitter, Facebook, or website, which is on the bottom of your screen, if you like that clip. Many people we have talked to aren't very familiar with Romblons, or Romblon, as Kyle referred to it. We love that. Incredible supply of marble stone, and yes, onyx stone. But what do we learn when we search the internet? Evidently, there is no onyx stone, nor even marble, for that matter, in the Philippines. It's just not there. Move on. It's left off the map and places of origin. Perhaps it doesn't export enough to make the list okay, but that pattern you will see repeats on practically every element of the Garden of Eden narratives when we look into these resources. And we'll show you each one and you'll see for yourself and you decide this is our opinion, but we strongly believe that there is some hanky-panky going on here. There is a large supply of marble and onyx stone in the Philippines, and they even export it. 
According to the Ron Blonde Tourist Department, Romblon marble is noted to be the strongest marble in the world. But it doesn't exist, of course. With many marble quarries located on the island of Romblon. By the way, we're going to have a little fun with this today, so please don't uh, take that any other way. Uh, we just think it is extremely weird that almost every reference we looked up, almost every one, seems to be covered up like this. Here you are, strongest marble in the world, and not even mentioned on the list. What? Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> Romblon Marble Industry produces high-quality tiles, tables, slabs, with an unbelievable amount of hand-carved marble products. But it must be inferior, of course, right? Recognized as Marble Country of the Philippines, Romblon is famed for its rich marble deposits. Romblon is the country's leading producer of high-quality marble, comparable to that of Italy. Italy has the best marble in the world, right? But Romblon's is comparable even to Carrera marble we've seen in references, but it's stronger. Last we checked, that means it's better. But it didn't even make the list. Why? Wait a minute. We keep talking about marble. What about onyx? Because this is talking marble, right? Well, when they're referring to marble here, they're referring to marble, onyx, granite, different types of stone that all kind of go together, especially when you're dealing with... Um, you know, countertop stone, etc. On the bottom of your screen, in fact, are photos of Romblon's special onyx, both Romblon black and Romblon green. And that comes from a distributor's website who's actually selling this stuff internationally. So, yeah, it's there. So, how does this track with scripture? Peace on River. Check. Bottom of the ocean floor surrounding the whole land of the Philippines, including the Benham Rise. Land of Havila. We have even had viewers comment that a mountain in Tai Tai was called Havila since ancient times. Different developments throughout the Philippines are actually called Havila, but where did it come from? It's a trace element of an ancient name, but they don't even know. Many people wouldn't be able to tell you where it comes from, yet it's there. Even areas which have been renamed. Ophir's brother, who went with him and Sheba to the Far East, both, by the way, in the story of Ophir and the Queen of Sheba, was named Havila, after that land, Havila. Gold. The Philippines has had the most abundant gold supply in the world in all of history. Mining began no later than 1000 BC, even according to Wikipedia. And the Philippines as a country still has the second largest untapped gold reserves in the ground, as far as a country is concerned. Because a lot of times you'll go up and you'll look up lists online. Don't be fooled. They'll show you a mine, or they'll show you a city. But they're not showing you an entire country. The Philippines is number two in the world as a country in untapped gold reserves in the ground to this day, even after thousands of years of mining an amazing amount of gold. We won't even mention the whole Marcos thing, but there is so much gold affiliated, associated with the Philippines. It's really overwhelming. So again, it doesn't just have gold, but the largest supply ever. That's significant, and that fits the passage. Pearl. Philippines has the largest pearls in the world, by far. It doesn't just have pearls, but the very largest. Significant? Check. Onyx stone. The Philippines has an abundant supply of Italian marble. Italian quality marble. Carrera quality marble which is stronger than Italy's. It doesn't just have onyx, but it has 
significance on the world stage, even if not pictured by Wikipedia on their map. Onyx Stone, check. All of this spells out that the Philippines is in fact ancient Havila, the land of Adam and Eve where they were created, which we'll go through in a second, and where they and their generations lived up until the flood and returned in the days of Joktan's sons, Ophir, Sheba, and Havila, joined later by the mariner sons of Javan from Japheth, who spoke Greek, who settled in areas like Deval and Mount Apo. These are Greek loan words. They are not, they don't fit the local language and they don't fit even Hebrew. And that's the language that those brothers would have spoken. And when you look at the references to Tarshish and his brothers, we went through this already, so you're going to have to go back and really look at all of the videos um, because we have references strewn throughout, but I believe that that was in part 10 where we showed you passages where it says that Tarshish's brother Kittim and, you know, Dedan and, and all of his brothers actually represent isles, multiple islands, yet scholars can only come up with one island for Kittim. <laughs> uh, no, that's not isles. Usually S means plural, I'm pretty sure. So, We'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. All of the resources from this passage line up to support that the modern Philippines, which is Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish, is ancient Havila, which fits perfectly, which was surrounded by the ancient river from Eden, tributary the Pisan River. There is no other way to view this, in our opinion. Not when you really break it down and look at all of the elements and all of the resources the way that we have. This, in our opinion, is indisputable. You could try to say, oh, well, you know, the onyx isn't, isn't significant enough. There's not enough of it in the Philippines. Well, there's an awful lot of it, and there's probably an awful lot that still hasn't been discovered, which, by the way, is another theme that we continue to see throughout some of these resources, and we'll show you. But let's look just a little further into the former name of Havila that we shared with you in the last video. The land of creation was first called Elda. We had a viewer raise a great question. Normally we show you the origins of names and place names, but we introduced Elda without mentioning much about it. We saw it was the name Jubilees gives the land of creation, which was renamed by Adam as Havila. Just as he gave Eve the Hebrew name Hava after the fall. Elda in Hebrew means God is called, known, loved, or favored. Now let's bring in a likely residual connection to the Philippines and Elda for a moment. There's a name, Imelda. It's actually could be broken down as two Hebrew words. Im, not sure how to pronounce it in Hebrew, means by, from, like, toward, or with, but that it's kind of weird because we're trying to figure out exactly how that ties into the phrase. So we dug a little deeper into the Brown Driver Briggs uh, definition, which actually looks at the entire sentence and uh, references the exact use of the word, uh, the Hebrew word, in the Bible throughout. And it means of fellowship and companionship of actions done jointly. If the common action be of the nature of a contest or combat, of dealing with a person, or of the relation in which one stands with, of a common lot, of equality, mm, or resemblance generally, of a locality close to, beside, in the house, or family, or service of, in the possession of, in the custody, care of. But what does all this mean? So, Imelda. I'm Elda. Nah, 
This is a Hebrew word, not English. But it means with whom God has loved, called, and known. It could refer to her relationship with Yahuwah God, perhaps. But it seems to be a name more about him whom she is with. Emel de Marcos, for instance, has stood very classily and loyally next to, not behind, by the way, her husband. And even till this day, something very odd, having watched a lot of state footage um, for visits from dignitaries in the U.S. over the years. Notice, in this photo... It's not just the two male leaders walking across the White House lawn, which is normal, but the couple is with just Ronald Reagan. Usually, Nancy Reagan would be there on such an occasion, but in this case, both Marcoses are with Reagan alone, and he is talking to Imelda. <laughs> what an example of the difference in the Filipino way of respecting a woman compared to the many other countries. We have said in comments when we picture the Queen of Sheba from Ophir, and don't play politics with us because we're not talking politics. We're talking about a woman who just handled herself very well. And you can't dispute that. I don't care who you are. You can't dispute that. We tend to picture Imelda Marcos just like the Queen of Sheba, <laughs> one of strength. And we can see that and have it illustrated right before our eyes, perhaps. We're not saying that Imelda is the Queen of Sheba necessarily. No, don't go there. We're not doing that. We don't care whether you like them, hate them, whatever. We don't care. We're not going to allow that conversation in comments, so don't go there. And don't blast us over saying such a thing because that's just stupidity. We're not going to play that game. That's a Jesuit game. We're not going to be drawn into um, arguments that are going to try to take over the stream and pull everybody away from what this video is really about. We aren't saying she nor Mr. Marcos are saints, which may be a good thing since some of the saints never actually existed in the first place, as we proved with the three kings and as the Vatican has even declared with some, such as St. Nicholas. There's something very different about this woman, though. But more so, Imelda is the name of many Filipinas, and coincidentally happens to go all the way back to the root of this land of creation, Elda, perhaps. Is this a bit speculative? Yes, it is. But we are not going to ignore this possible connection because these all add up. Even circumstantial evidence actually does matter in court. You may dismiss it if you wish. That's fine. Oh, yeah, and we didn't hear a rumor somewhere that uh, after this time... Imelda has committed tons of gold back into the Philippines as they had promised. So maybe they're not so bad after all. In America, we learned that they were evil and she was all about shoes, which now we find out she got most of them for free probably. But that's a whole other thing. And does this not tie to Solomon's gold? As even the will we saw online admittedly just online. We haven't seen the actual will. We don't know. We can't authenticate it. We're not saying it's authentic. We're not going there. But Solomon is even mentioned in this will. If we can come up with some new information on that topic, we would love to do a video on that as well. But for now, back to the Garden of Eden. And all the days of Enoch, Genesis 5, 23, 24, were 360 and five years. 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, Yahuwah, and he was not, for God took him. Now, without the book of Jubilees and Enoch, this is all we know about Enoch. 
and in Sunday school, which in teaching such, I remember using such charts. Um, we showed charts showing Enoch walking up steps to heaven, which isn't true. <laughs> That's not where he went to live. He did make a trip to heaven, but the Bible doesn't say he walked there. It says he walked with Yahuwah, God. And because of his strong relationship, which we've told you and will keep telling you time and time again, is what this is all about. The greatest prophet of all time, and we have nothing from him. He wrote as a scribe, but nothing according to the canon of Scripture from him whatsoever. Well, other than a quote in Jude attributed to Enoch, which is really a direct quote from the book of Enoch, but no, couldn't be, right? Scholars even dismiss that, some of them, and it amazes me. It is difficult to understand that Enoch likely is the writer of both of these books, Jubilees and the book of Enoch. We cannot prove that. But no one else can prove otherwise, especially those who do not believe the Bible anyway. And many scholars do not. And they don't believe that Enoch is still alive. So let's look at Jubilees. Jubilees 4, 23 and 24. And he was taken, now this is talking about Enoch. He was taken, Enoch was taken from amongst the children of men confirms Genesis, and we conducted him, this is an angel speaking, writing, into the garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writes down the condemnation and judgment of the world and all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, Yahuwah God brought the waters of the flood upon all the land of Eden. For there he was set as a sign, and that he should testify against all the children of men, that he should recount all the deeds of the generations until the day of condemnation. So Enoch was transported by the angels into the Garden of Eden. You know, the Philippines, and he's still there as he will be until the day of condemnation, which is what? The day of judgment, the very end of everything in Revelation playing out. What is he doing? Well, he's still writing, and he's preparing to testify against the children of men. Does that not also sound like the prophecy of Matthew 12 and Luke 11 from Yahushua Jesus? The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment and condemn this generation, the final generation. Enoch is preparing for his role in the last days as well, just as the Philippines should prepare for its John the Baptist type role. See, Enoch will be one of the two witnesses. There's a lot of speculation out there about who the two witnesses are. But there's only two men in the Bible who never died. Only two. Enoch and Elijah. You can guess other people, which is what scholars do. They're all guesses. They don't know. They don't have any proof or evidence of otherwise. It's all guessing. We are going to share another scripture about Enoch, which will introduce the Mount of the East, in which he sacrificed to Yahuwah God. We are going to explain this in detail, though, the Mount of the East, in the next video, where we are really going to cover the Mount of the East so far in detail, and it is going to blow your mind. Time to spice this up. Jubilees 4, 24 through 26. And he, Enoch, burnt the incense of the sanctuary, even sweet spices acceptable before Yahuwah, on the mount. What mount? Mount of the East. For the Lord has, Yahuwah, has four places on the earth. The Garden of Eden, which we know, and the Mount of the East. Okay, now we've got the fourth. And this mountain on which thou art this day. This is speaking to Moses, 
and he's on Mount Sinai, and it says Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, which will be sanctified in the new creation for a sanctification of the earth. The whole earth will be sanctified through Mount Zion. Where's Mount Zion? On the navel of the earth, in the center, which is a great place for it to be, in which Yahuwah God to use it to sanctify the entire earth. Through it will the earth be sanctified from all its guilt and its uncleanness throughout the generations of the world. Wow. This is a one-time atonement that will cover all. All of history. Wow. So, just like the tabernacle and temple, Enoch already knew how to sacrifice to Yahuwah God. This again introduces the fourth holy place of Yahuwah God on earth. And we will give that more time in the next video, as we said, because it will tie to Safar and the journey of Joktan, which is amazing. We located the other three holy places, and we will locate the fourth as well. This just simply says sweet spices in this passage, but we are going to show you more specifics on what these sweet spices may have been and what spices were used in all of these applications. Remember, where did Enoch live? He lived in ancient Havilah, the same land as his forefathers, the land of Adam and Eve. So he didn't likely travel to Ethiopia to get frankincense, did he? He didn't go to Yemen to get myrrh, did he? Or did he go to Persia to get Galbanon? Or Northern Europe or West China to get Crocus? Or how about India, mainland India, to get Nard? These are some of the spices we are about to review, and all of them are supposedly only grown in Babylon, Ethiopia, Yemen in general. Funny, those are the same places we keep hearing over and over that are stealing the history of the real Havila. Well, we prove that this narrative of ancient spices, which can only come from one place on earth, which is nowhere near where the ancients lived, <laughs> is absolute fluff. First, they don't know, because scholars don't know where the Garden of Eden is. So, we have a massive advantage by restoring that history. See, this is why things like this are important. So don't try to demean our work, please. Now, for the old spice saga, beginning with Adam. Yep, Adam. Jubilees 3.26, and on that day on which Adam went forth from the garden, he offered as a sweet savor an offering, frankincense, galbanum, and stacked, and spices in the morning with the rising of the sun, don't misread this though, from the day when he covered his shame. So he started at the rising of the sun. He wasn't worshiping the sun. I know some people have tried to make that point in some videos. No, 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 no. Adam didn't worship the sun. He knew the sun was significant, but nowhere near as significant as Yahuwah God. He knew him face to face. Give me a break. We are going to go through this list in a moment, and we're going to show you what scholars say, and then we're going to offer the real truth. This is not the only place where Adam is referenced to have sacrificed, however. We're going to show you what we believe to be an occult-manipulated source. Oh, look out, look out. So maybe you need to close your ears or skip that frame if need be. But you're an adult. You can handle this, and you can decipher and discern for yourself. See, that's what you need to learn. That's what we all need to learn. We don't need to learn how to be censored. And, oh, no, please keep that away from me. 
because I can't handle it. No, you can handle it, and you can discern it for yourself. But sometimes you knew, you need to understand what the occult is saying. So then you can see the truth. You can see the evidence revealed right in front of you of what they're saying. Because they're slapping you in the head right now when, when you're watching movies and television and ads and everything else. I mean, they're just smacking you upside the head and with occult reference after occult reference. And you have no clue what they're saying. I mean, President Bush can sit there and say, the first Bush can say, the thousand points of light. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of people don't know what that is, but the thousand points of light is the religion of Freemasonry. <laughs> it is satanic. It is Luciferian in origin. It has nothing to do with Yahuwah God's word, never mentioned in the Bible. Again, we do not believe this book we're about to show you a clip from. And we may never use it again. Maybe we will. We don't really concern ourselves with, oh, oh, I can't read it because it's a Dead Sea Scroll, because that's not even a, a, a real truth either. So a lot of that has been so manipulated for so long. But we look at this with great skepticism, and we look at it as what it is, an occult reference. So, okay, let's read it. Let's see if it has value, but let's compare it to the Bible. Let's make sure that it fits, because if it's completely different and goes in some other tangent, we're not using it, and you won't see that on your screen from us. In this case, it's okay. It won't hurt you a bit. From the life of Adam and Eve, 29, 1 through 6, according to this, we're not quoting this directly, we're quoting this from Rabbi Cohen Shalomim Halevi. Now, we're not saying we believe Rabbi Cohen either, okay, so <laughs> we'll go into that, but when Yahuwah had said these things, he ordered us, cast out of paradise. And your father wept before the angels. This is referring to Adam, of course, opposite paradise. And the angels said to him, what do you want us to do for you, Adam? See, they loved him, and that actually fits. I'm okay with that so far, are you? Probably. Your father answered and said to the angels, see, you are casting me out. I beg you, let me take fragrances from paradise. Now, why would Adam want to take fragrances from paradise? Because he wanted to atone for his sin and sacrifice. That's why. So, when the angels allowed him, and they likely would have, this makes sense. I mean, I, there's nothing in this that bothers us. He gathered both kinds, crocus, nard, cinnamon, and other seeds for his food. Now, did this really happen? We don't know, but it makes sense, and it's palatable. It's plausible. Does it justify the rest of the book of Adam and Eve, nor any of the rest of this rabbi's thoughts? No, no, and we're not going to share them, so don't worry about it. We do not like where the book of Adam and Eve heads, and it is not like Jubilees in Enoch, which we do quote more often, especially Jubilees, because both of those largely verify and clarify Genesis. And we may not ever use a passage from the life of Adam and Eve again. As we said, what we want is the list of spices. That's what we're looking for here. And we have that now, crocus, nard, cinnamon, and there's even other spices, but at least we have a few that we can vet, test, and see where do these grow, where are they from. Whether they came from the garden or not, perhaps they didn't, but it appears maybe they did. They must at least grow natively outside of the garden because Enoch sacrificed as well, and so did Cain and Abel and Noah. Adam taught all of his generations, and why did they sacrifice? To cover their sin. Interesting, though, that Adam may actually have taken some spices with him from the garden, if this passage is true, and that is fascinating. But let's jump into the Old Spice Saga. 
because these are the most ancient of spices, the most sacred of spices after all. Don't worry, we won't mention the Spice Girls. Well, except for now. First, let's take a look at the cinnamon, because that just comes from one island on all of Earth and nowhere else, right? You are going to hear that theme throughout these references. Amazing. Cinnamon, according to Wikipedia, though its source was kept mysterious in the Mediterranean for centuries by the middlemen who handled the spice trade to protect their monopoly as suppliers, huh, what? <laughs> um, the location of where cinnamon came from was kept mysterious in the Middle East for centuries? You mean by Hiram, King of Tyre? Could that actually come from a different area that actually had trade routes established by King Solomon on the Red Sea port? Like Ophir, maybe? No way. Couldn't be. Why, cinnamon is only native to Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And that's it. Well, that's what Wikipedia says nowhere else on Earth. It can't possibly be native anywhere else, no way, no how, except, well, even Encyclopedia.com admits it is cultivated in Ophir, Philippines, and the West Indies. Oops, well, there's that, but cultivated means it was transplanted there, perhaps, and not native, right? So there is no way the tree is native to Ophir. No. See, this is the way scholars view things, with blinders. In fact, even the reference here, cultivated. Cultivated could easily mean grown natively. It, it refers more to processing, but it, it's the same thing. Is there native cinnamon in the Philippines or not? That's what we need to know. Because it's not on the list. Well, it's kind of on the list here in the second reference, but, uh, well, maybe, but it's just cultivated, so it doesn't really count, right? Well, does it count or doesn't it? In all fairness, before 1980, a discovery was made at that point, so perhaps no one thought so, well, except we're going to prove that wrong, too. They discovered Cinnamomum sabuese, sabuense, however you say it. It's called Cebu cinnamon. It's a species of cinnamon endemic, which means native, to Cebu Island, Philippines. It was first discovered in Cantipla, Cebu in the mid-1980s and described by Kosterman's in 1986. The tree is endemic, native, to the island of Cebu, but several trees have been found in neighboring Kumoti Islands and Sikajur Island. Endemic? Well, native. So Cebu cinnamon is in fact native to Cebu and other surrounding islands. Here's what is really neat, though. If Adam used cinnamon to sacrifice, then he would probably plant it near or on one of his prayer mountains, wouldn't he? That's a term, by the way, used by one of our viewers regarding Philippines mountains that we love. And one of the telling things in this whole thing is the fact that Cinnamon is found in the Philippines. So it's not just from Sri Lanka and a couple of other places, is it? The mountain where cinnamon was found endemically growing on was Mount Manungal, which coincidentally is the tallest mountain on Cebu Island. There's an odd history to this one, too because it's where President Magsaysay 
crashed in the Philippines presidential plane in 1957. We aren't going to read into that any further, but it is interesting to note, nevertheless. The name Manu is an ancient reference to Noah after the flood. Nun is the actual letter N, basically, in Hebrew and means offspring, continue, heir. And Gal means a heap, wave, or billow, which is a wave. So, Manungal means Noah's offspring continue after the flood, or similar. Wow! Is this the mountain Adam sacrificed on right out of Eden, though? We do not believe so. But interesting that the point in which native cinnamon was discovered, and it probably is in fact ancient cinnamon and no one knew what it was for many years, is actually named after Noah's offspring. But as usual, this is not the only cinnamon in the Philippines. Though Cebu cinnamon is more like common cinnamon, there is another. Remember, the passage before did say both kinds, the kind you eat and the kind you use for sacrifices. Kalingag, pictured to the left, is another cinnamon in this case only found in the Philippines, which produces a resin for incense, oleo resin. It is found all over the Philippines from northern Luzon and the islands above to Mindanao. Yet, only there. Hmm. Didn't we read that cinnamon is only cultivated in the Philippines? Yet, this species is only found in the Philippines and it's native, endemic. We think that may mean it didn't come from somewhere else, just a th- theory, of course, right? So, much for cinnamon only growing natively in Sri Lanka or India. Way to go, Strong's Concordance, because that's where one of these references came from. Oh, and the word Kalingag, the Filipino word for cinnamon, appears to have Hebrew roots as well. It seems to refer to the resin produced from the sap fountain and the light bark in weight on the outer surface or the top. But don't be silly, this must be a coincidence because it almost fits the biblical cinnamon better than the common cinnamon from Sri Lanka. But see, to make this assumption that that spice can only come from one place could be fine if that place fits the narrative. But Sri Lanka does not fit the Garden of Eden nor Havila. No. And did scholars have that data on this one in order to consider it for biblical cinnamon? Well, since 1909, at least, as there was a chemical study done on the tree back then. The challenge is they are stuck in a mindset that only the Middle East existed in ancient times and that is ignorance. But this is how they are trained in a very controlled paradigm. Let's all break out of it. The word crocus used in the previous passage is assumed to be a plant that only grows in Europe to West China. But the word is not crocus, it's kabatsaleth, I don't know if we said that right, in the Hebrew. According to Holman Old Testament commentary, when used in Song of Solomon, the word is referring to the Rose of Sharon, which is quite different from the crocus that only grows in the north. This Rose of Sharon, though, is not actually a rose. The photo in the background here is actually from Zangbuanga, Philippines. The Rose of Sharon is also known as Aaron's Beard, Great St. John's Wort, and the Jerusalem Star. In the Philippines, it is called Gumamela, which is an hibiscus. So, let's look at that. 
Gumamela, also known in Visayan as Labuag or Sepinyat in Tagalog, is a very good ingredient in cooking native chicken soup. Not sure crocus would do so well in that application. So, it is more likely the spice Adam used. Well, first, it's in the area of the Garden of Eden, so yes, more likely what Adam used. Our point with all of these spices is simple. Scholars do not have enough information to make massive leaps, especially that these spices can only come from one plant that only grows in one place on earth, which always ends up being a pagan capital. And they do it almost every one. We object to such logic. These are ancient references, and sometimes words even completely change meaning over thousands of years. To make the claim that there is one and only one spice that fits any of these references, any, either one of them, not one of them, is ignorance, no matter how you shake it. Oh, let's take a look at the word, by the way. Could it also have Hebrew origins? Well, we do find the word mela, which means to fill in Hebrew. However, we do not find a Hebrew equivalent for guma or splitting the the word up. We just don't see it. So the fact that even one of these words, however, could actually have Hebrew origins is remote. Whether alone, most of them, and you'll see most of them do. Here's two, but there's more. Nard. Now, this one is used in Song of Solomon as well. And where exactly did Solomon trade during his reign? Well, many places, but was not the most significant, the one that he built a special navy in which to go there on a three-year journey to the east, to the multitude of islands? So, discount that some of the spices he mentions might actually come from Ophir? Hmm. No, that's ignorance. Even Strong's Concordance assumes Nard must only come from India. But what have we said about India before? If you remember, we mentioned that scholars forget that even in the days of Josephus, the East Indies and Philippines were often times attributed as part of India. So they would reference India, but they meant the East Indies. They are citing a source, in this case, Strong's is, from 1833. So it's an old source. And it's actually written in Latin. We went and looked at it, couldn't read it, but it's written in Latin. (laughs) Likely meaning it was eh, Jesuit-inspired, perhaps? Hmm, Perhaps. Probably. Likely. Maybe definitely. But could it be possible that we are right that this reference to India could include the East Indies and Philippines? Or are we just crazy? Eh, maybe we are. Or not, because here's a reference that's very interesting from 1817. The A period Nardus, Indian Nard or Spike Nard, as it comes from the East Indies. Where? That doesn't say India. It's called Indian Nard, yeah. So scholars see Indian Nard and they say, oh, that comes from India. Um, As it comes from the East Indies. Is a matted congeries of fibers probably said that wrong, issuing from one head and probably forming the root of the plant. Spikenard has a warm, pungent, bitterest taste and a strong, not very agreeable smell. Actually, that sounds familiar, especially when you look at a picture of it. In 1817, close to the same time, this is Encyclopedia Britannica, Rendering the definition of Indian nard or spike nard, nard as 
coming specifically from the East Indies, which again includes the Philippines in many cases. Not mainland India, but the East Indies. It could certainly include the, the Philippines. But is there a species of nard in the Philippines? Well, maybe. Okay, yes. But this appears to be another resource in which we have only become aware of, at least outside of the Philippines, in 1990, as it may have been mistaken as lemongrass prior. And it looks like it. That's pictured in the background. So, okay, we'll let scholars off the hook and give them the benefit of the doubt here. Well, except that was 25 years ago. And it's time to catch up, guys. So, how about an update? Here's the data. Balanu is the Filipino word for nard, also known as citronella grass. One great use as incense to ward off mosquitoes. Oh, and it does appear to have a Hebrew meaning, but we know that's just a coincidence. That couldn't possibly be, well, actually, it's a direct, well, yeah, it looks like it is. Bala means swallow, confuse, destroy. Does that sound like something that it does to mosquitoes, perhaps? You better believe it. And new means to hinder, restrain, or frustrate. But that couldn't have anything to do with uh, confusing and frustrating, well, mosquitoes, could it? You better believe it could. No, let's just ignore this for another 2,000 years. <laughs> because ignorance is bliss, right? Well, whoever said that was not ignorant, but taking advantage of those who are. Research it, and you will find Jesuit roots to that quote. Moving along. In dealing with these sacred spices, Song of Solomon also mentions kalamas, the others we will also deal with. Kalamas is also known as sweet flag. Sweet flag is probably a native of China and India. <laughs> really, they have to go there again. And what is India in many ancient references? Well, just look at the rest of the definition. Its use as a medicinal plant dates back to Egypt, Greek, and Roman times. It is found in many parts of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Papua New Guinea, and locally in the Philippines, Bantok and Benguet provinces specifically, and outside Malaysia in Indo Indochina and Thailand. So, it is found in the Philippines. You know, a lot of these things, they, they have to just make these statements that mislead now, in this case, it comes out and it tells us the truth. It comes out and it tells us, yeah, it grows natively in the Philippines. But before that, it had to say, well, you know, it's, it probably just came from China and India. Uh, based on what? Do they ever have a based on anything? Because we don't seem to find a whole lot on that. And whenever it does, it's usually bogus. But let's look again. Here we go. Let's look at the Filipino words. Lubagan, which is the Tagalog or Bisaya word for sweet flag or kalamas. And Darao is the Ilocano word. Lubagan is three Hebrew words. If, oh that, I pray, beg, an enclosure, garden. We're not sure how to put that together necessarily, but perhaps it means that I pray in the garden, in the enclosed garden, perhaps. And we'll talk about that one. Darao is really interesting because the word dar, D-A-R, means pearl or mother of pearl. Have we heard pearl in the context of the land of Adam and Eve before where he sacrificed maybe 
I think you know the answer. And the ending, ow, which sounds like the A-H, ow, in Hebrew, according to Eberim publications, is a noun meaning brother. Does that refer to Adam? Maybe. We can't make that direct connection in this case. But the fact that these translate to Hebrew words at all is absolutely amazing. And again, several of them do. Another sacred spice mentioned in the context of Song of Solomon is aloe. The reasoning used for aloe is that it must have originated in one place and nowhere else on earth. Because, you know, if you find a picture of something or a pictograph or however you want to call it, if, if someone sketched it, you know, 6,000 years ago, then it must only grow there. It can't grow anywhere else. I mean, come on, that's called logic, right? Really? Here are their exact words. Aloe vera's use can be traced back 6,000 years to early Egypt, okay, where the plant was depicted on stone carvings. Cool. Known as the plant of immortality. Absolutely, we agree. Aloe was presented as a burial gift to deceased pharaohs. We'd agree with that. Before we're taken out of context, again, we agree that aloe grows in Africa and have no issue with that necessarily. But of course, this gets more specific. The reasoning that because a plant was depicted on an ancient stone carving, it never existed anywhere else on earth, is sheer stupidity. That's not logic at all. It means it grew near Egypt. Yes, we'd agree. But to then eliminate the entire rest of the world is actually very telling, especially when added to all these other references that always seem to lead to the same places, the same ones consistently used to take credit for Ophir, Sheba, Havilah, the Three Kings, and even the Garden of Eden. Imagine that. Another coincidence, of course. Though it grows all over the world today, aloe only originates in, okay, take a guess. You probably guessed it, Somalia, which is Ethiopia in ancient times. Imagine that. Aloe vera is not originally from the Philippines, but from the Mediterranean region and the native plant of Somalia. It was found in 4th century BC, so it didn't come from anywhere else. It's never grown anywhere else on earth. It's only that one spot and no place else, really. Again, just because they found it in the 4th century in Somalia does not mean it never grew elsewhere around the world. Very misleading. Aloe grows all over the world today, and probably native in many parts of it especially the tropical areas like the Philippines and East Indies, the spice capital of the earth. This is our point. History well records the spice capital of the world, and biblical scholars have ignored that area in almost every one of their characterizations of these resources, even when it is clear in ancient times. Writers referred to the East Indies, including the Philippines, as India. Are scholars doing this on purpose? Doubtful. Because they are educated within a false paradigm. Yes, we said that, false paradigm. And if you don't see that yet, keep watching because we will prove that in time if you haven't seen it already. Their paradigm is one really of modern thinking, reading far more modern scholarship than actually digging into the Bible for themselves and interpreting it for themselves based on what the text says and using the Bible to interpret the Bible. No, they're using other scholars to interpret the Bible. And those scholars, in these cases, and many that we've already proven, are wrong. Easily, provably wrong. It's just like science and history these days. You play along or you lose your job. We don't have to follow this paradigm because we are not dependent on that system for our livelihood. We just seek the truth wherever it leads. In addition to the list of spices used by Adam, Enoch, Solomon, Exodus shows us incense that Moses used to sacrifice as well. 
Exodus 30, 34, And the Lord said, Yahuwah, said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacked anaka and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. This defines what the Bible means by sweet spices, by the way, which was referenced before with Enoch and Jubilees, but not specified. Here's some specificity. Most of these are the same, but we'll cover them all. First, we dealt with frankincense in more detail in Part 11 regarding the three kings as well as myrrh. But a brief review, which, if you wish to debate us, go back and watch the full understanding in Part 11. Frankincense is not a Hebrew nor Greek word and is never actually used in the Bible. In the New Testament, it's the Greek word libanos, and we are told that we must accept that libanos refers only to the frankincense that only grows in Ethiopia, basically. There are major problems with such logic, though. The word libanos originates from the Hebrew, a word, libona, which is rarely interpreted as frankincense in the Old Testament and mostly interpreted generically as incense as in the case of the Queen of Sheba narrative. It's not frankincense, it's just incense that she brought. It doesn't say which. Although, she had frankincense that she could have brought, and we'll, we'll show you. Even the Greek word in which Libano stems is a generic word for incense. So, did we say, even in part 11, that it's only because, and we'll show you the next frame, it's an old French word, therefore, you know, someone tried to hit us with that, and, and they tried to reframe the argument as that was our sole logic. And our whole logic was much more involved than that one little teeny tiny point. And if you take any little teeny tiny point out of much of this argument, it's easy to debate it, but it's a false narrative. Um, because it's not what we're saying. We're saying the whole package. So please keep our words in context, Jesuits, when you're challenging us. Otherwise, we'll let you have it as we have. But the word frankincense was not even used in the days in which the Bible was written. Therefore, it really doesn't belong there. I mean, why not just go ahead and use the Hebrew word? Why try to translate it into a word that is Old French and wasn't even used until 300 AD? But we had one viewer, and really just one, who reframed our position, and we discussed this. But what they left out was the fact that we showed them the original Greek and Hebrew, and the word isn't frankincense, it's incense. See, that's a Jesuit tactic which we will typically spot, and you will see curt responses from us when someone reforms our narrative. We do not like that. We will not accept that. And then attempts to create a debate from a false narrative. That's a Jesuit 101 tactic. Nope, we are not playing that game. We just want truth here. But again, omitted from that viewer's comment, we showed you that if it was frankincense... There is a frankincense in the Philippines, the gum LME, and it's even referenced to or as poor man's frankincense. Not because it's of lesser quality, but because it is less expensive. Why? Because supposedly the ancient reference to Libanos, which is really Libona, which is not even always interpreted as even frankincense in the Bible, can only be the Ethiopian frankincense because, well, we know. Well, that, that's just that, that's, they knew. Everybody knows that, right? We just know. And that's it. That's about all we ever get. Well, we know. You, you know, the scholars say, well, I don't care what scholars say. I care what scholars can prove. Yeah, we know. Who is we anyway? Or it's been passed down for generations, which, who's? Was it a lie from the origin? <laughs> 
Because the Bible does not ever say this incense only comes from Ethiopia and nowhere else on earth. Here's the really odd thing. We purchase anointing oil, or similar, from Jerusalem today. Has anyone ever stopped to think it is not from Jerusalem? Frankincense? But it had to be imported into Jerusalem? So why are we paying premiums to buy something from Jerusalem that doesn't even come from Jerusalem? That's quite a racket. Frankly, we believe this should be made in the Philippines, the land of Havila, the land of the Garden of Eden, not Jerusalem, as the spice more likely originates from Havila Ophir, not the home of the goat lady trying to steal the history of the Philippines. Look into who owns those farms in Ethiopia, of course, as someone is benefiting financially from this hoax. Sorry to use such a strong word, but it is what it is, and we're going to call it what it is. Did we prove this could only come from the Philippines? That's not our point. We don't care if it's grown elsewhere. We only care that it's grown in the Philippines, because that supports the narrative that Havila, Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, Elda, the land of Adam and Eve, the land of creation, that it's all tied together. It's all intertwined. And how did Moses get a hold of spices from Havila, Philippines? They were likely already trading with Egypt at that time. However, if he substituted with the one from Ethiopia, that is fine. But we believe Solomon restored the true supply from Ophir and Havila. The significance to Libanos interpreted as frankincense and the sacred spices is where they originated. And Ethiopia, Yemen, Babylon are not precious, sacred places to Yahuwah God. Yemen's getting a little closer because Mount Sinai is not far from there. I'll give you that. But it is not the Garden of Eden, the Holy of Holies, where Yahuwah God dwells. And what about Shem? Though we have no reference that he ever made a journey himself to Ophir, do you think his offspring just headed east and forgot all about him? Not likely at all. Not even possible. They never journeyed back to visit him with gifts? Really? Shem sacrificed, and we will even prove later that we believe him to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. I know there's a big comment battle going on about that, and we'll settle it because we're going to produce a video on it. But we believe this. We, we truly do, and, and we believe we can prove it. You may not agree with that, but when we unveil it, regardless, Shem definitely sacrificed this in the same fashion as Noah. That's indisputable. What do you think Shem would have requested for them to bring back from Havila his ancient land once they found it? Perhaps spices brought out of the Garden of Eden by Adam himself? Or at least from the land of Havila where Shem lived? For not just a few years, by the way, but the first 100 years of his life. Do the math. Noah had Shem at 500 years of age, and the flood came at 600. That makes Shem 100 years old at that point, when the flood came. He lived there for 100 years. It was very sacred to him, not to mention the history of it. Do you think Shem forgot his native land? No way. That's why two of the names in the Table of Nations even were named after his native land, Havila. Frankly, we picture Shem at this point, and which is probably around 250 years of his age, as a frail old man. But that's not how the ancients were. They were more pure and stronger than we which is why they lived so much longer. Shem lived till the age of 600, 
so he wasn't even at midlife yet at this point. He probably traveled to Ophir himself later. He probably visited Mount Sinai as well. And he probably journeyed to Mount Zion because he would know how to get there. Yes, Shem could do that. He did, after all, assist in building the ark, remember? So he kind of knew how to build not only a boat, but a big boat. They were in his territory, and he would have known how to get to each one. Again, we are stuck in a modern mindset where we are far inferior in physical ability, mental capacity, and longevity compared to the ancients. But see, we see it as evolution, and that's backwards. Evolution has never been proven. Not a shred of proof has ever been presented, and we will shred it in the Flood series. I mean shred. By the way, when I said that, what I meant was within a species, yes, there's adaptations. We agree. That's proven. That has happened. Minor adaptations, yes. But a species evolving into another species has never occurred and could never occur. We will prove scientifically it is actually, according to science, impossible, not improbable, but impossible. It is a hollow theory, and after 150 years of trying to prove it, uh, it's time to scrap it, guys. We know Yahuwah God has three holy places on earth. Now we know a fourth, but it's adjacent to one of them, the Garden of Eden. The one that is linked to the sacrifices Adam gave, Enoch gave, and Noah gave is in Havila, Ophir, Philippines, the Mount of the East. And we're going to discuss that more in the next series. This is why Solomon built a special brand new navy and brand new port on the Red Sea to go to Ophir, Havila, Philippines at great risk for resources. He wanted to restore this link to the native land of all creation because he knew. And if that passage from the life of Adam and Eve is correct, and we are not sure 100%, okay? So calm down on that. Adam brought these spices from the very Garden of Eden and planted them in Havila. Wow. So these came from the Garden of Eden itself, the Holy of Holies and dwelling place of Yahuwah God on earth. Now that's significant. That's worth the risk Solomon took, and it's worth any amount of money. And once again, the LME is not the only option for frankincense and myrrh, as the pili tree is in the same family and even bears a name of Hebrew origin, meaning hope. We will address this word further in the next video because we have found even more significance to pili. There were 53 species of this species in the Philippines, but it has been reduced to nine over the years. See, this is part of the story. Philippines is ancient, so there are things that have been lost over time, yet there's still enough to determine that it is ancient Havila, Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish. But no way any of those biblical sacred spices could originate in the Philippines. They must come from Ethiopia and Babylon and nowhere else. Wrong. That's just poor logic and not logic at all in most cases, which you're seeing. Well, we are trying to clear up as much as we can in this video, but the next spice requires more research. We just can't find any more on this particular spice. But we'll bring it in and show it to you anyway. Galbanum is an aromatic gum resin, the product of certain umbiliferous Persian plant species in the genus 
ferula. I don't remember seeing that in the Bible. Don't remember it saying genus ferula. That's just not there, is it? Chiefly ferula gomosa, cinnamon, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and ferula, blah, 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 blah. Okay, galbanum, yielding plants grow plentifully on the slopes of the mountain ranges of northern Iran. And nowhere else is mentioned, of course, in the passage. Uh, okay, Wikipedia, whatever. The actual Hebrew word here is kalbena. We cannot find a connection otherwise. However, absorbing everything we can find written about this, we find no evidence it has to be this particular genus ferula and nothing else. That's ridiculous. And What's northern Iran? Oh, that's the land of the Medes, which was a territory of Japheth's son, Medai. Though we question this, we cannot prove today that this one comes from anywhere else, but we also cannot prove that Galbanum refers to this specific plant that can only grow in northern Persia. Something is missing here, and we know it is because it is in every other case, and we've been able to find it in every other case, but not this one. We've tried hard. We just haven't found it. If anybody does, please let us know. We'll keep searching as well, and hopefully we'll find this someday. Stacked. Derivation of the botanical name Styrax called Storax by Pliny, the elder, derived from a Semitic Arabic name, Ashtarek, officinalis, <laughs> derived from Apophysina, shortened to Aphysina. Storax, the Hebrew word Nataf, Nataf, stacked, is a cinnamon of Zori, meaning a liquid drop. So they're going to quite an extent here. Its gum is obtained by making incisions in the stems and branches of the spice stacked is used in the holy incense. Okay, in Exodus 30, 34. Now that's what Wikipedia tells us. But you can go to Wikipedia, in fact, and view the history of this plant in several references, but few ever say where it originated. Rather odd. We know that Josephus' writings on accounts like Mount Sinai are conspicuously missing the kind of detail he usually provides in other passages. Could it be the same of spices? Perhaps. This claims Pliny the Elder says it came from the Middle East. How can any scholar be definite in any of these thus far? The answer, they cannot. They don't know. And that is what we are proving today. We are not saying the alternatives we are providing have to be the spice listed either necessarily. However, we strongly believe that when Israel could do so, they used spices from the land of creation as opposed to anything from the Middle East. Babylon. Ethiopia. No way. This has led to an entire industry of overvalued spices, and this trade should belong to the Philippines, as these spices originate there. Ancient Havila. This plant may well grow in the Middle East, and that's fine. No issue with that. But does it grow in Havila, where Adam, Enoch, and Noah, and and uh, their generations sacrifice to Yahuwah God? That foundation in logic is missing from the traditional position. And until it is restored, the traditional position will be wrong on pretty much every one of these. Styrax is a genuine softened resinous tree and shrubs 
with a wide distribution spanning temperate and tropical regions of the Americas, the Mediterranean, and East and Southeast Asia. Now, they didn't mention that in Wikipedia, did they? Uh, before. The taxonomy of the group is historically confused hmm. with numerous published names, arguably with little justification. How about that? So he's saying those scholars are wrong. Recent revisions of the North American distribution and imbricate group of the East Asian component have largely alleviated this problem though the valvate group of the latter, as well as the neotropical species of the genus, are yet to be treated. Several species, primarily of East Asian origin, origin have been grown and appreciated as ornamentals, but make up only a minute fraction of those known and described in literature. This reference from the University of Delaware recognizes that the history is confused and unjustifiably so. See, when one looks at this through the correct paradigm, restoring East Asia into its full history, it alleviates the problem. And that's what he says. We share that sediment on all of these. Even though several spices exist natively in the Philippines and East Asia, they are practically erased from these descriptions and from history. He continues, The largest centers for the genus occur in East and Southeast Asia and the Neotropics. The genus is also represented in the Mediterranean and the Middle East though limited to only one species. So only one species comes from the Middle East at all. Therefore, this is their circular reasoning, that must be the species. It must be. It can't be anything else. See, there's the problem with this thinking. The fact is, is the Bible, when it uses a word, an ancient word like this, is not necessarily being so specific because we just can't go back and determine that this is only the plant that grows in the Middle East and that's it and nowhere else and that there isn't possibly another genus within that there isn't another within the species group that could be used for the same which usually is the case he further says Styrex lineus is a genus consisting of approximately 130 species, so see, of both deciduous and evergreen woody, often resinous, they have resin that can be used for incense, trees and shrubs with a wide distribution spanning East and Southeast Asia, the Americas, and the Mediterranean. So it, they're all over. They're not just in one spot. The Changeostyrex is an East Asian genus described relatively recently, Chen, 1995. So he even references a newly discovered species in East Asia. So they're still discovering species, which we have seen with others of these spices as well. However, if scholars are ignoring this paradigm, and they're not keeping up with increasing knowledge, they will never see this. And that is sad, but most likely to be the case. So yet, another spice actually found in ancient Havila, Ophir, Philippines. Also mentioned in the spice passages is Annika. This one is really odd because the actual serious claim of many scholars is that this is a spice that comes from the upper column of a mollusk shell, probably a sea snail. It's the trap door of the snail shell or part of the snail, however you want to call it. But the point is, it's shaped like a fingernail, and that's supposed to be significant. Again, in order to believe that they brought this spice into the tabernacle or temple, 
which they did, one would have to discard what the Bible calls unclean animals. There is no way an unclean animal would have been used in sacrifices as evidenced by Noah taking extra clean animals onto the ark for future sacrifices. See, they knew better. We offer the scripture from Leviticus, which is on the screen. Does the sea snail have fins and scales? No, it does not. And if even their carcass is an abomination, which it is according to this passage, doesn't that mean you will not find it in the tabernacle or the temple? Exactly. These are scholars of what? Clearly not the Bible. The original word shekeleth was replaced by anika by the Septuagint translation. Anika, in turn, is derived from the onyx stone, meaning fingernail. Wait, Anika is derived from the onyx stone, yet this same scholar, and yes, this same scholar, arrives at the conclusion that that refers to the operculum of an unclean animal because the operculum is shaped like a fingernail? So is my fingernail. Maybe they used human fingernails then based on that kind of logic. Ridiculous. Onyx stone itself can be crushed into shavings, which are and have been used for incense in antiquity. Why mislead people like this? From the church in Greece's website directly. Even the fact that burning incense was a small holocaust funny they'd use that word, the incense is wholly consumed in burning, attained symbolic status that became even more apt as the incense became a mixture of clay, resins, and crushed onyx. See, even the Catholic Church, or whatever church this is, I assume it's Catholic, maybe it's Orthodox, um, they're using crushed onyx to this day. This is a modern reference. So why, why dismiss that from your thinking? I, it makes no sense. So even today, they use this crushed onyx, and they can make the connection between onyca and onyx stone, and then go off on a tangent of fingernails, because a word that could be interpreted out of that could have a definition that means fingernails. Wow. And then to say, oh, well, fingernails, well, that must be a sea snail. <laughs> okay, sorry to laugh, but come on. This kind of deception requires a good amount of intelligence, actually. And we believe is clearly intentional because these guys are far too smart to fall for such stupidity. Again, maybe not the scholar that wrote this, but the people above him, oh, yeah, they know better. At least we'd like to give them that much credit anyway. But wait a minute. Haven't we seen a reference to onyx in the description of Havila? The onyx stone? Hmm. Genesis 2, 11 and 12. The name of the first is Pisan. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is delium and the onyx stone. Now, doesn't that make more sense? You know, China and the Far East have been using crushed onyx as incense since ancient times, including the actual incense burners being made out of the onyx stone. This concludes the spices from the references we used from the Bible. We're showing here 10 spices, sacred biblical spices, that were used in ancient times in the context of Adam and the temple and uh, Solomon and different references like that. We've researched 10 of them and 9 out of 10 of the cases were being told 
that the spices can only be found in the Middle East, Babylon, Ethiopia, basically. And in 9 out of 10 of the cases, we've just proven to you that these spices all exist in ancient Havila, the Philippines. Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish. But there is one more element we wish to deal with today regarding ancient Havila and the Garden of Eden. This is after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Genesis 3, 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Uh-oh, fig leaves. Fig leaves, leaves come from fig trees, right? And where do fig trees come from? The common fig, Ficus carica, is an Asian species of flowering plant in the mulberry family known as the common fig, or just the fig. It is the source of the fruit also called the fig, and as such is an important crop in those areas where it is grown commercially, native to the Middle East and Western Asia. Of course, its fragrant leaves are 12 to 25 centimeters, or 4.7 to 9.8 inches long, and 10 to 18 centimeters, 3.9 to 7.1 inches across, and deeply lobed with three or five lobes, kind of like a clover. Oh no, it only grows in the Middle East and Western Asia. Ah, well, here we go again. Guess we have to throw out all this research, maybe just trash this whole video, or, or do we? Um, well, notice the length of these fig leaves. 12 to 25 centimeters, or 4 to 10 inches. And look at the leaves pictured in the background of your screen, which have a clunky clover-type shape, 3 or 5. Could these be used to make aprons? Not underwear. Aprons is what the passage says, which would be a little more like a grass skirt or perhaps something even longer. Well, they would be awfully short in sewing these together, maximum length 10 inches, and that would have to include extra rows in order to make that happen. It would make for a very delicate apron as the leaves would have to be sewn together on top of each other in many different ways. So hope Adam and Eve aren't planning on walking or sitting or moving around much because these are going to fall apart really easily. Maybe they just didn't know what they were doing. Those poor, unevolved barbarians. Or just maybe they were a lot smarter than we. And they used the fig leaf, which actually grows in Havila to this day. How about that? Yes, there is a Philippine fig. Its leaves are more like that of a palm tree, in fact. The Ficus pseudopalma is a species of fig known by the common names Philippine fig, Dracaena fig, and palm leaf fig. In nature, it is endemic, native to the Philippines, especially the island of Luzon. It is known elsewhere as an ornamental plant. Indeed, the species name Pseudopalma means false palm. The leaves are up to 30 inches long and edged with dull teeth. So, decisions, decisions. Do we use the maximum 10 inch clunky clover leaf or the 30 inch long 
straight, palm-type leaf. This leaf would create a grass skirt-type apron, which fits the narrative far better than the common fig. See what happens when you think in the right paradigm? And why is it important to do so? We know that doesn't affect your salvation. But if you are not growing in your walk with Yahuwah God, regardless of the bogus, once saved, always saved doctrine, which ignores Yahusha Jesus' actual warning that some would face him saying, we cast out demons, we prophesied, we performed miracles in your name. Let us in. And what does he say? These are pretty advanced Christian roles, by the way. I mean, the average Christian isn't casting out demons and prophesying and performing miracles. So, what does it mean that these people were doing those higher level things? And what does he say to them? Depart from me, for I knew you not. Do you know him? Not did you recite a prayer. Do you know him? How do you know him? You know him by spending time. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, right? Spending time with him and also in his word and all of it. Not just the scriptures that, in fact, tickle your ears. They make you feel good about love and how, you know, it's, you know, all these good, positive things that make us feel so good about the Bible. That's the ear-tickling doctrine, by the way, not the God culture. Digging deep into the Bible and into history and taking folks far deeper. We've heard from a lot of people, a lot of people, and overwhelmingly it's been extremely positive. These people are digging deeper into Yahuwah God's Word than they've ever dug many of them that we hear from. And it makes us cry because that is all we care about. Because that, sorry, sorry for tradition, that is the definition of salvation. Continuing to dig deeper, continuing to grow and flourish and blossom in His presence and in the Word. Because that is all that matters. It's all relationship. The Bible comes alive when you press in for true meaning. Again, the point of this video is not to prove that frankincense, for instance, is a specific tree only found in the Philippines. Yeah, there is one actually called frankincense, referred to as frankincense. But that logic, that exact logic, is exactly what we are disputing in relation to these ancient spices. We are creating room for the position that Havila Ophir Philippines is the location of Adam and Eve after the fall, as well as the Garden of Eden. Further evidenced by the fact that these biblical spices may have actually come from this area, the Philippines. Not Babylon, not Ethiopia, not the Middle East, as is assumed in faulty reasoning, which we pointed out to you. In our next video, we are going to go deep in the Philippines and show you our theory of exactly where the Garden of Eden is located. We're going to dig into place names, into legends. We're going to pull out all the stops and spend some good time identifying the exact location of what we believe to be the Garden of Eden. That video will be a theory, but as always, we will support it strongly. Thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
and view our website at thegodculture.com. There are slides there, available for free download on most of our videos, and others will be coming in time. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless. Thank you.